and now it's, it's recording okay so this this project as i mentioned before um it, I, I started it because i wanted to be able to kind of look back on the activities i had first um i guess in singapore first um and around the world as well um, I guess it started because in, in Singapore, when, when after a few years of doing things and, and we look back at our activities, uh, we, I found that we didn't have that much material to work with, not, not a lot of documentation. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I decided to try and actively document this uh, Singaporean biohackers at least, or, or I don't really like to use the term biohackers, DIY bio people I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. And then when I came here, I kind of expected that there would be a lot of documentation as well uh, for historical purposes but as I found out when people talk about the history of hacking a lot of it still refers to the American history of hacking right. and that was when I realized that maybe it's a good idea to keep on continue doing this and just keep on collecting materials and yeah. um, maybe one day balance the what I would call the historical hegemony yeah, of yeah. the United States yeah. at least in this area and it's also a good way of um, getting to know people yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially if you're traveling from place to place. Yeah, yeah. It makes a big difference because then you go to people in different parts of the world mm. and you get to see. And when you go home, you're like, okay, wow, from Germany to Denmark, such a big difference. Who would have guessed? Yeah. Okay, um, let me just move this closer because I think. Just to test the volume. Okay, so uh, I'm not exactly in the frame at the moment, but I think that's fine. Okay, so that's why I'm doing this. And where, when I started this project, I called it uh, the Hacker Archive. And that's basically the term I'm going with now. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a YouTube page. Okay. So I want to put all the, the, the interviews up there. Okay. Um, there are, I think, one interview and two two talks out there at the moment and the reason why there's only three is because I haven't had the time to upload the rest. No, I know. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you, you, you get more caught up in doing than actually putting it up. Yeah, yeah. Same yeah. with me. I have three or four experiments that I've just done mm. and left around and you're like, I should write about this. But <laughs> then you're so busy doing the next one that you're going to go back and write about the last one feels like you're going back in time, ah, oh, I could have done this better, shit. Then you get stuck, so right. it's, a, it's a really long process. I totally understand that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, the thing is, I will put this interview online as soon as I can. No, I want it to no rush, no yeah. rush, of course. It would be nice if uh, I could get to see it before mm. it goes up. Mm. Okay, yeah. definitely. Um, for everyone that whom I interview, I give you like the, the yeah. interview itself. That would be super yeah. and, um well, standard archival standards, I suppose, is um, at any point in time, if there's something that's too sensitive, we can do one or two things. Number one, you can tell me to cut it out, yeah. or we can put, and that's my preference, we put an embargo on it for a certain number of years. Um, What's an embargo? An embargo means, okay, I've, um, here's some, some information that maybe shouldn't go out to public yet, or I don't want it to go out to public at the moment, so let's keep it away from the public for X number of years or until I die mm -hmm. and then we release it. Yeah, so that can be done as well. Okay. Mm, although that's slightly more complicated because you yeah. need to, yeah. So you record it and then you crop it out but you, you, can, you can use it after some time. Yeah. Which yeah. makes sense, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So how will the great paintings of these guys come out after they're dead and you know? Yeah, yeah. that's a, a long wait. Yeah. But no, but still we can figure something out. Yeah. Yeah. It, I know in, in Singapore and I guess uh, el elsewhere as well, the archivists, they would, the National Archivists, the first thing they do in the morning is check the obituaries. Really? Yeah. yeah. Like, okay, uh, someone's dead. Do I have anything to release? Oh, yes! This guy died. Okay, good. <laughs> no. Okay, so then, um, yeah, you have uh, some questions. I have, mm. I'm sure you have some questions in mind. Yeah, um, so for, for me, I'm interested in the person as well as the space. So I guess let's start with the person, okay. yourself, and um, I guess my question, my first question would be, uh, you came from India, right? Yeah. Uh, which part of it? Okay, 
so long story short, I grew up in Bombay. I uh, studied in my school in Bombay till I was 18. Then I went to the south of India for my bachelor's in mm. biotechnology. Four years into that, I felt that it was a really technical course, which was awesome. It gave me basics in electronics, machining, design, uh, a lot of other stuff. It focused on biotech, especially towards the end. But I felt like I wanted to get more into the sciences, which is why I switched from an engineering into a master's in science. And I chose the topic of genetic modification. Because you come out of biotech, you learn how to make bioreactors, how to how you're gonna put a modified organism in this, it's gonna produce a product. But how do you make that organism? And then that's what caught my curiosity. And then I went on to study how you do it in plants. Because when you study plants you learn how you do it in bacteria also. Because bacteria are what you use to transform plants. Then I found out that the genetic modified organisms, especially plants in Europe, is a really messed up scenario because you're not allowed to use GMOs in fields, at least in Europe. Mm. So job opportunities were limited. Um, I worked in sales for a while in India and I got my visa application to Denmark for residence, got accepted. So I moved here and the reason why I'm here is because my family's been living here for the last five years. So it was nice, you know, get to stay with them, come home and I was lucky enough to well, when I left India, I knew I was going to a new country, a new culture, and it's kind of hard to meet people immediately, you know? So I said, okay, I'm not going to have a social network. Maybe I should learn something new. So I bought an Arduino, and I bought a Raspberry Pi. And that became my friends. Started learning how to blink an LED, how to write a small script in Python, and then I found LabTech. So I think that's rough history of um, how I got to Copenhagen, and yeah. Right. And, and you mentioned just now that there was a guy from MIT uh, Media Lab who inspired you. Yeah. Uh, who is this person? His name is uh, Professor Ramesh Raska, and he's uh, an Indian professor who's now based in Boston in the Camera Culture Lab at MIT. Uh, we met in this last December 2015 in India when I was down for vacation and I was um, sort of working on this uh, plant sensing project. You know, you could put a sensor in your plants, get the data on the environment, see how it grows as a function of time and a lot of other parameters. And then he said, why are you thinking small? You know, you have a good idea, but then Wi-Fi is not going to work outside your house. Think of how you can affect the next 5 billion people. I was like, okay, this is, this is, this seems deep. And I went back and I thought about it. And I said, okay, maybe I could um, actually make this work. Then I went back to the grassroots of my um, plant biotech experience and then said, okay, maybe is, is there an actual relation between how plants are growing and how global warming is actually changing for the environment? Mm. And I found a couple of equations, papers, algorithms that actually strongly support the fact that um, plant growth is significantly affected by the environment and changes in the weather and stuff like that. I mean, it, it's obvious that you think it, you know, you're like, okay, if it's getting hotter, something's gonna happen. We, we can take our t-shirt off, but plants can't do that. They can't shed skin. Mm. If it gets really frosty, we can put on two jackets, but they can't do that. Mm. So how are these changes affecting plants and how we can change farming practices? To adapt to the new climate is what my current project is focused on. Right. So you're still working on that. That's the one that you told me about the last time. Right? Yeah. And you've developed a sensor of sorts? Yeah. yeah. It's a device. It integrates different kinds of sensors. I'm not an electronics person. I can't make integrated circuits, so I buy these integrated circuits from manufacturers, OEM manufacturers. And then I assemble them and uh, control them to give data in an orderly manner that can be uh, stuck in a database and then perform equations or algorithms on these um, this data that's gathered to actually give viable information back from them. Because it's, it's what kind of information, sorry? It's one thing to gather data, right? So if I'm, if I'm finding out that, let's take an easy example. Um, 
it's really hot and it's really dry. Uh, what happens is plants they have they also they have the bottom of the leaves if you can see they have this thing the stomata and it transpires. So if it's really dry, uh, they transpire more. And if they're transpiring more, they also drink more water from the soil. On the other hand, if it's really humid, they're not going to transpire as much. So they're not drinking as much water from the soil. Mm. And how farming practices work is, uh, a lot of people, they just have a, a fixed amount of water that they put in the fields. Mm. Technology has reached the point now where you can actually change the rate of water applied from one part of your farm to the next. Mm. So this is, is a kind of technology that can assist a farmer understanding do I really need to apply as much water or at the end of a growing season or before a new growing season, do I really need to add so much fertilizer? I know the company says that you have to add 500 or some amount of pounds for a certain size of field, but what about the fertilizer from last year? Is it still left? Things like that. These are the kind of questions I'm trying to answer mm. with the, the device. Mm. Has it gone for fuel test yet? No. So, as you know, Copenhagen's not the most uh, sunny place in the winter. So, right now, we've developed the, the prototype of the uh, device. And we're manufacturing about 20 units so that we can stick them in fields this uh, May. So, time's running short. I mean, I have two months to have 20 units. and. I'm not obviously going to make a custom design. I'm going to get the electronics fabricated, but I'm not going to make a custom design for the the outside. You know, like the body of the instrument. I'm using, I've hacked a couple of uh, very easily available sources to make a nice enough, good looking body that I can use for my experiments. Mm, okay. So, trying to do more with less as mm. always. You mentioned we, so you're working with this with uh, someone else? Yeah, so I have a partner in India right now because okay. we feel that Denmark is a really lovely country but there's only limit to the amount of outdoor agriculture it does. So we feel like a product like this has to have a strong uh, mm. a base in countries that have tropical climate or actually do outdoor agriculture a lot more. And being from India and having this network in India, I was able to have one of my um, batchmates from school, from university, who's working in India right now, mm. who's also interested in this project. So we decided to start working together. Mm. So she specializes in crop resource management. Mm. So basically all the understanding of how you would actually plan to use a sensor. If you have a sensor and you put it in the field in one place, and you just leave it there for the entire season, you're going to get a very narrow data set. And at the same time, you're not going to put 500 sensors in one small field, right? So there's a concept of rotation mm. that needs to be applied to get really efficient data. And the kind of planning and experimental planning design and stuff that goes into this, this is what my partner helps out with, mm. aside from the business. Mm. And what I do is the hardware and uh, basically the driving force behind the mm. business model. So try and make connections, get it out there, and yeah develop the product a little more. And in terms of funding, do you guys already have funding? Well, no. It, that seems to be the hardest part right now because um, we get people who are really interested in it. We get invited to incubators and things like that to pitch and stuff. And then what I found out is that you have to really find the right kind of investors. Because if someone's in for like four or five years, that's not the kind of investor I'm looking for. I need someone who's going to think more long term. Mm. Because the, uh, a product like this is not something that you make and you sell immediately. Mm. I mean, you have to put uh, effort into development. There's manufacturing involved. So it's a lot. It's a it's a bigger undertaking than a small app or something like that. Not to say that that's less important. It's just that you get to go from one iteration to the next really quickly. Yeah. So investors can see development really fast. And that helps uh, getting money as well. Mm. So I'm still looking for funding. Mm. If that would be an option, that would be great. But I'm also looking really hard to see the kind of investors that I'm meeting with. Are they short term, long term? Are they interested in hardware? Or are they just interested? Can they also provide more than just money? Mm. Because money is fine. I mean, you have a rich uncle in India, you can probably get more money than most investors can give you. But uh, 
they have to have a connection, a network, and actually feel like they want to make your company uh, thrive. Mm. So it's more strategic than just money. So the 20 um, units that you're producing now, that's coming out of your own investment. Oh yeah, right. mm-hmm. very much so. It's, um, I think with hardware, you have to actually, with anything actually, if you have a prototype or if you have field test data or you've validated your product with customers, that's really good. Yeah. It's just that with hardware, you actually have a lot of initial investment to actually do this. Um, with software, not so much. You can sit with your computer and then get iterations done, put it out in the market. So that's nice. Uh, but I feel like I want to actually build something. I have the thing to actually make it. Yeah. Something physical, something you can interact with, something you can um, touch, uh, for example, like if you can hold something, because I was always a, a, a bit nerdy in school, you know, I had a Game Boy and I had all the Game Boys, would love to open them up and things like that, and I felt the connection to these uh, kind of things because I could actually touch it. Mm. There was no apps, there was no iPads, computers were fun, yes, but uh, you can't do the main function of a computer by opening it up. Once you open it up, it's on. You can you can touch it, but you can't touch a program. I, you can I know with uh, with uh, virtual reality now maybe that's gonna change. Mm-hmm. I don't know, but that's yet to see. Mm-hmm. Okay, and, and you mentioned as well um, before that when you were back in India, you you were um, helping out the hackerspace there, or you set up something yeah. there. So What's basically, um, in India. Uh, we've had one of the biggest networks uh, in the biohacking space called Hacteria. Mm-hmm. It's set up in by three people, one of whom is an Indian person living in Bangalore. Mm-hmm. And they did a lot of good work. They had a lot of workshops in uh, Bangalore in 2013 or 14, I'm not sure. But they've been in the scene since way back in 2009 mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And they were really inspiring, but then I felt that it's been a bit quiet for some time and maker spaces like the design ones with the 3d printers and laser cutters they're popping up everywhere now and I feel like biohacking or DIY bio is not getting as much uh, not getting as much exposure people aren't learning about it as much as they learn about a laser cutter for mm-hmm. example and I guess it's also because you need people from the field who can help you understand it mm-hmm. now if you if you're gonna use a laser cutter you don't need a degree or you don't need a background. You can just learn how to use the software. You And people don't ask you, how does that exactly work? Right? So you're not going to have a physics degree and explain in lasers and things like that. It's an equipment, a device. You use it, get your job done. When you go into DIY bio, on the other hand, it's a little more uh, intensive. You know, Someone's going to say, okay, I want to do an experiment with blowing bacteria. That's going to take a bit of reading. Right? First, they have to read. With a laser cutter, you go there with a design, boom, boom, you finish it, it's done. When you're going to make glow-in-the-dark bacteria happen, you actually have to read what is media. Mm. What is bacteria? These dirty germs that we have inside us? Okay, how do we grow them? You have to, st- what, is, what does the word sterile mean? That means what we clean our toilet cleaner with? No, it's sterile. Yeah, you have to learn a bit before you actually dive into it. Mm. And you need people to lead the way. Because if you, uh, if I want to do uh, DIY bio experiment. There are easy ones, but then those are like blinking an LED. You know, you do it, and then you're like, okay, I want to do something more. And this, the infrastructure to actually do this is not present in India at the moment. This is where I wanted to come in. I had a couple of people I met who were really talented and who were driven with the same motivation. Uh, and I found these maker spaces in Bombay that actually have the design, and I said, okay, let's do some biohacking. They were really excited because someone has to take the initiative right mm-hmm. so i took that i did a couple of workshops in bombay and then there was a maker fest that happened in gujarat which is towards the west of india and we went there we had a stall we did about six six different experiments each of us did two and i had three team members and we called it hack biosis it was crazy you know like symbiosis hack biosis and uh, we did stuff that ranging from uh, an algae photobioreactor to um, chromatography with fluorescent dyes. We extracted some chlorophyll, did some chromatography of chlorophyll, 
my friend had a muscle sensor which he bought, which he programmed to uh, operate, do various operations, and he was showing that off. So he showed people that making is fun, but when you make something that interacts with biology, you're, you're going a step further. Mm -hmm. And a lot of parents came to us. We also did the dirty DNA extraction workshop. Yeah. We had a lot of kids come in and they're like, wow. And we, we made small necklaces for it as well. So people could wear your own DNA and that was the pitch. People really liked it. Um, we found a lot of people who said we've never done anything in bio before, but this is it's pretty interesting. If we could do it with kitchen chemicals, then maybe it's not as hard as we think, right? And that was the idea. You break the ice about bio, biotech, synthetic biology. And then when they want to learn more, then you have this wide network of people who have actually done work before. Where you can point them in the right direction. But I still feel you need a space and you need dedicated people who are actually willing to spend time in helping new people get on board. And now since I'm living in Denmark, that's what I do for Theologi Garage. I mean, I, I love reaching out to the community finding people's motivation and getting them involved. Mm -hmm. well, when I got here last year, the space was pretty, pretty uh, lonely. So I used to sit a lot with the electronics guys, but now we have a nice group of people that come down pretty often mm -hmm. and do fun stuff. Okay. So. So when you did the bio stuff back in India, what year was that? 2015? 2015. Last year, last December. Actually, it was I was down from December to Feb. Yeah, so I just got back. So December to Feb, I was down in India, and okay. I did all of this in that small amount of time that I was there. Okay, um, but you, you you set up the bio uh, bio hacker space there, right? Not exactly, because you know we didn't have I didn't have the time to actually set up a space. Right. So I set up minimal infrastructure. I set up a kind of a website where people can get information on things. Mm. We did workshops at spaces where we could, for example, you go to a makerspace mm. and you do a pop-up bio workshop. Mm -hmm. So you don't actually have to set up the space, you don't have to get all the equipment, much like how we're sitting here. This is a dedicated lab. Yeah. We didn't have a dedicated lab, we would just get all the equipment, have a nice big bag or box, mm. carry it around and do workshops at different places. Mm. So it was more like a pop-up bio space, I guess. Mm -hmm. So that as so, am I right to say that as late as 2015 or well, December 2015, there wasn't much of a bio network in India? It's, it is, it but India is a huge there. country. Yeah, yeah. It's like pockets. So in Bangalore, yeah. Bangalore is really strong. So you can find the cluster there. You can find the guys who uh, started Hacteria. Mm. One of them is... He's pretty active now. I saw a website where he's uh, been doing summer courses and having an art in science residency program, mm -hmm. things like that. What's so, uh, Yashas. Yashas. Yeah. So, um, and I found out through other connections in Bangalore that there is some stuff going on. But it's, again, it's a huge country. Mm -hmm. So it's not like if something is going on in Bangalore, people are going to travel from Bombay to Bangalore. Mm -hmm. So I, I see it as... You know, Hacktier is a really nice global network mm. that connects Europe to America and all of this stuff. But at least for a country as big as India, you need to connect five major cities and have this going on for it to be a success. Mm. If you're doing it in Bombay, that's not enough. If you're doing it in Bangalore, it's not enough. You need people doing it in every space. Like for it, for example, in in Denmark, you could if you do an ex like a, um, a workshop here in Copenhagen. People from Malmo, people from other parts of Denmark, they can come here so quickly, like two hours drive or something. So it makes it easier. Mm. If you do it in Bombay, if you have something going on in Bangalore, that's 16 hours by drive. So that doesn't make sense. You have to have a different mm. network set up or a different physical space. And then if someone's visiting, then they actually... But it takes a lot. There's a lot of infrastructure that has to be set up. Mm. And it takes people who are motivated to do so. Mm. And it doesn't pay. So bio, being a biohacker is not a full-time job. So you have to find ways to make it work without... Or maybe if you get funded by some nice philanthropist, mm. that would be great. Mm. Do you think the people in India are open to the idea? Yes, most certainly. I think um, 
of deep biohacker spaces are different things to different people. Some mm. people see them as <coughs> some people see them as a place to hang out. Some people see them as a place to uh, do some quick fun stuff on the weekend. Some people see them as okay, I can actually make a product. So you have to be able to understand the kind of network and people that exist, the community that exists mm. in the local area. Mm. Whether they're going to be down there every day, whether they're going to be down there uh, once a week, once a month, mm. and this is what I started doing now: understanding the community. Mm. Are there really people who would want to do biohacking? Mm. If there are, then maybe it makes sense to actually set up a space. If uh, not, and it's kind of a chicken and the egg problem. If there's a space, people will come. Yeah. If people come, then you make a space. What comes first? Right? Mm. So this is um, the point I'm at. But I think that a lot of people from India need to go abroad, <laughs> visit Europe, visit America, and see how it's done, mm. and then take that knowledge back to India. Mm. And I try as much as I can to do it while I'm down. And yeah, hopefully the next time I'm down in Bombay for more than a month. Something good will happen. Yeah. Well, I, I guess um, my question comes from uh, an, another angle as well, um, because I've I've heard that in Pakistan someone was trying to set up maker spaces, and the trouble was when he went to different institutions to to get this thing set up, he faced a lot of trouble from um, I guess older people, who, and and their attitude was was basically uh, like. Okay, we can we can bring in this new stuff like a laser cutter, say into Villa or something like that, but they won't let people use it because if people use it, it might spoil. Um, that sort of attitude. So I'm wondering whether yeah, you, uh, India is affected by the same issue. No, so we have the at least the people who have started the maker spaces, they've gone and seen how it's done. Mm -hmm. So if you have a laser cutter, sure you can spoil it, but that's why you have a training. Mm -hmm. So you're not allowed to use the laser cutter until you get training done. In Labatech, there's a lathe, and a lathe can kill you if you don't know how to use it. So you have to go through training to use the lathe first. Mm. So it's, it's as with any equipment, 3D printers, right? They're expensive stuff. You can break them if you don't know what you're doing, so you have to go through a training process, which I think is really good. We're doing something similar with the bio lab. Mm. So there's a lot of equipment, there's a lot of stuff here, and you can do really fun stuff. But what we find is that people come here, they're really amazed with the space, and then they're like, okay, they were a little hesitant to come back. And I think that's because you don't have a time to sort of break it in, you know. Uh, me, I was a little uh, forthcoming, so I said, okay, I'm just going to go and find out what I can do and how I can do it, have a rough idea, I'm going to make it work somehow. Not everyone has that motivation, so you sometimes maybe have to organize an introduction class. This is device A. You can use device A to do certain number of things device B does a certain number of things and you can mix the two of them and then people get the spark and then they're like okay maybe we can actually do something here so I feel it's important not only to have a space but to have uh, people pushing or helping or getting involved so you have to have a full-time person there sometimes he may be doing nothing sometimes he may be doing way too much but you have to have someone who's dedicated to actually building the community and you can do it on a volunteering basis, but then it most likely ends up someone has time, they do a lot, like right now, for me, but maybe in a couple of months I'm going to get extremely busy and then what happens then? I mean, if I, if I don't find someone to replace me, then it might just go dark or quiet again. Mm. Okay. And um, when did you arrive here in Denmark? I got here 12th May 2015. May 2015 and when did you come to know about Levitat and Biology in uh, Somewhere in maybe August? August. Okay. How did you come to hear about it? So, I was looking for jobs and my mom was like, okay, you know, Copenhagen is a very different place. A lot of people volunteer, so maybe you could volunteer, you know, you make some friends make a network and then you won't feel so bored and like stuff like that and I was like wow okay sure it makes sense so I was looking for volunteering especially related to plants because okay I like plants I'm good with it I can actually do work in this area and then I saw an expert a post on Google about growing plants indoors 
underground. He's like, this seems interesting. And then we look at it, and there's this place called Labitat that was doing it. And then I was like, okay, Labitat. Then I saw the wiki page. Ooh, hackerspace. What's a hackerspace? Literally, that's how I found What's a hackerspace? <laughs> then I know that they have every Tuesday is open house. So I went down on Tuesday. Uh, I was pretty amazed. So I walked in, I was like, wow, this place is cool. And then someone gave us a tour. And I never saw the people who were also present on the first day. I never saw them again. But me, I had an Arduino which I broke and I wanted to fix it. So I fixed the Arduino on the first day and I was like, wow. I felt this sense of achievement. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm, I've done something cool today. I want to go back. Now I have something more. And I wanted to learn how to solder. Because I've never done that before. And I really wanted to learn it. So I came back next week with um, some Arduinos which I had to solder on. And I learned how to solder. Mm -hmm. That was it. Then I was down almost every week, a couple of times a week after uh, building devices, uh, putting all these crazy ideas into practice. And yeah, it's what I've been doing now. I've still been out of work, but it's not felt like it because I have more than one product which has commercial value now. It's just about execution because I'm really good at putting initial ideas together and then, you know, swinging them around. But then when it comes to the actual part where you need to make it a business, that's when you need help from outside. You can't do it just yourself. Mm. Sorry. No worries. That was just a false alarm. <laughs> yeah, so. Okay. Well, for, for me, for me, last year to this year, uh, you haven't been employed in a, a standard kind of nope. job. Really. Nope. Right. Have you been freelancing? Uh, yeah, I do. So when I was in India, I did some workshops, got a lot of money from there. Uh, I came to Copenhagen with a bunch of savings, which is now almost dead. So <laughs> it's been nice, but it's been really, my family's been really helpful because I didn't have to pay for rent mm -hmm. and food, which is really nice. If I had to live here paying for my own, I would never have come here. Man. It's not an, it's it's pretty expensive country, and yeah. Tell me about it. And also, I mean, it's nice, but they have their own system and their own culture. So if you're an MSc in Denmark, it's really most likely you will go do a PhD because they have different categories of workers. You have scientists and you have technicians and scientists PhDs but technicians which you would or research associates which you would expect an MSc to do they have a special school where you go and you get a diploma it's like you don't do a bachelor's you have your specialized uh, training like a vocational training and then they have a strong union that says you can't give jobs like this to MSCs because we have a school that puts out only technicians if you hire an MSc for a technician job what will these guys do? They don't have a degree. Mm -hmm. So the system is really unique. So getting used to that, finding out that you're stuck between a rock and a hard place is not really a good sign, but yeah, you make it work somehow. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Copenhagen has got a really nice startup culture. Mm -hmm. It's got a lot of stuff going on and there are a lot of people interested in doing business. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so the, now you have a few products that you're waiting to to push out yeah. with a, a business development manager, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. I have recently made, hopefully, the next two months is really exciting. Mm. But um, I like, I'm just going to keep working and hopefully something will come by. Mm. And should something not work out in the next two months, I have very strong potential in India and I'm just going to go back. I mean, I know it was like, you know, usually you go abroad and you you spend, you make money there, you have a good life. A lot of people from India immigrated to the U.S., different parts of the world. But things are changing now. Mm -hmm. It's not the same. You know, if you can go back and make a bigger success of yourself than you will ever do in a different country. So it's not like I'm here just to, to be away from India. Yeah. I'm here because I would like to be with my family. That would be nice. Mm -hmm. It's also... A nice country to live in. It's given me a lot in terms of the biohacking and the hackerspace and stuff like that. I've learned a lot, and I can say it's made me. It's helped me advance in my, if not in my career on paper. I mean, sure, you get a job and you learn 
how to punch in and make reports, but I've learned more about management and science and technology than I could have learned in any job. Mm -hmm. So I think this last year has been more of a learning experience than anything else. And it would never have happened if I was busy sitting in an office. So I guess I've learned more than I've earned, but I love it. Mm. And it's been good, right? You you went over to uh, the US as well? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I can say that uh, my little hacks and inventions have taken me to California, Silicon Valley, to meet with Y Combinator. And that's something that people who's living in Silicon Valley are dying for. I should have prepared a little better, you know. I you know I was thinking of the product, the product, the product. But when you go meet investors, especially someone as big as them, you really have to have the business down, like completely. So I'm gonna take my time, get either find a business person or really up my game to I can be like a businessman myself. Mm. But yeah. So how did that happen? How did you get uh, all the way to Silicon Valley? Did they invite you over? Yeah. I filled an application, made a video demoing me and my co-founder. We demoed, not demoed, but we gave our pitch, a one-minute pitch, and we had a really, a great idea for a really good market, and we had done some development as well, and they liked it. They actually loved the idea. They loved the market. They loved the pitch. It's just that the numbers, when it got down to numbers, which is my weak spot and also my co-founder's weak spot, it got a little shaky for us. You know, what's your market? And with a disruptive product, I had no idea back then. You, it's really hard to assess a market because right now it's functioning how it is because this product doesn't exist. But when you disrupt a market, you can base your product's market on what exists already. And that's something I didn't know at that point. And the question about how big is your market, how much money can you make? That was where we faltered a little bit. But again, they say, please apply the next time because most of our people who get accepted, they apply at least two or three times. So, yeah. mm. And if you've made it to an interview, that means you've gone through a process of being qualified already. So yeah, it's just about seeing, have you really grown a lot from the last time you applied? Mm -hmm. Or has it been left or stagnated? So yeah. Mm -hmm. how, how does that experience compare to your, your experience of the incubators and accelerators and startups here in, in Copenhagen? It's Silicon yeah. Valley, man. We can, Silicon Valley is the melting pot of everything new. I mean, I don't know. If you, if you develop something really great in any part of the world that everyone can use and has a really big market, you will most likely relocate to Silicon Valley. That's how it used to be. Things are changing now. I know that a lot of uh, other hotspots for startups are starting, Copenhagen being one of them. They've got a really nice ecosystem there. But I feel like in Copenhagen, they focus a lot on students, you know? So for example, the Venture Cup is a competition, but you need to have been a student from a Danish university in the last one year or someone on your team. So it feels like they're doing good stuff, um, they have this startup competitions. A lot of the limitations though are that you need to have a student from a Danish university on your team or someone needs to be a student who graduated in one year's time or you need to have a professor. So they're really tying it up with the Danish ecosystem. Recently I found one incubator that actually said that yeah, if you we take people from everywhere, which is good. Because if you're gonna say you oh, you need you, these are the conditions and these are the terms, you're gonna cut a lot of great ideas out. What about people who are have graduated two years ago? Now what? And they have the biggest idea ever. They can't apply to this. And then they make some special considerations and stuff. But then a lot of people who read the website are gonna be disheartened by saying this this is not this does not apply to me. Mm. And the biggest competition is the venture cup mm. that has this limitation. Oh okay. dear. So, I guess they have a lot to learn, mm. I can say that much for sure, and if you compare it to something like Silicon Valley, I'm sure there's de any place in the world has a lot to learn, mm. so. Mm. What, what's it like in India, the startups? And India was e-commerce, oh my god, e-commerce to the, 
to the sky and beyond. I mean, but that's what we're good at. If you've heard of any of the the stereotypical Indians, we're just IT. That's mm-hmm. what we do. Every every country, the Indian guy does kind of IT. Yeah, because we do produce a lot of IT engineers. Um, but that's fueled an e-commerce system, and most of the big companies that have made it really big and survived are actually e-commerce. Mm-hmm. And which is cool, but then. I guess uh, being in the hardware area, mm-hmm. in the bio area, we, we don't have many mentors or many uh, things to look up to because mm-hmm. every time you hear of someone making it big, raising a lot of money, being successful, it's usually e-commerce. Mm-hmm. So I guess the Indian ecosystem has to diversify. So you have good ideas, people doing good stuff. You have you have more engineers than Denmark. There are more engineers in India. Than the population of Denmark. <laughs> so, I mean, come on. You have to have some guys who can do something more than e commerce, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot to learn in uh, India as well. Mm. Okay, and, and I, I googled you a little bit, and uh, you graduated from this uh, from Nottingham, yep. right? Um, why did you prefer to come to Denmark rather than the UK? Is there well, there's this guy, his name is. Uh, What's the pre- prime minister of the, the UK? Oh, David Cameron, I think. Cameron, yeah. He made this really shitty rule that if you come and study in the UK, uh, even if you get a job, you need to you be, need to have been working for a minimum of six months before you finish your after you finish your degree. And after you finish your degree, you're given only four months extension of visa. So basically, my visa expired, even though I had a job, I was working there, and then they were like, no. So the only way you can get to stay in the UK after your um, course is done is if you get a graduate training job, which is like a graduate job, you get it and you go straight there, it's like training three months, you get that, and usually they're all in London and they're all in finance, like mm-hmm. Goldman Sachs, things like that. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to work in my field, mm-hmm. and I didn't want to pick up a PhD just yet. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't an entrepreneur at that point in time. I wanted to just use the skills that I got from this course and work in science. Mm-hmm. But they tried to crack down on the immigration, which I think completely backfired on them because no one wants to study in the UK anymore. I mean, sure, it's great. You can go there, but you can create value for yourself in that country. So people are going to other countries like America and Australia. Will totally open doors to people who come study. They say, "You've come to our country. You've taken knowledge from us. Now give it back. Work here. Do something great, right?" And that's what we would have probably done in the UK, but they have this really strict visa policy. So, who knows? Their loss, I guess. <laughs> okay. Okay. And all right, let's. Let's get on to the hackerspace here, uh, to Biology Garden. Uh, so you've been here for a while, and um, I guess you maybe you've seen it grow a bit, or just the situation? Yeah, I mean, um, when I first joined, it was quiet. There was one biohacker working here, she was really cool, she introduced me to the space and stuff. And then when I came back the next time, it was quiet. The door was closed, everything was lights were off. And, but then I came and I was working in the electronics room and got things going and then there was a friend, there was a guy who came down and said I wanted to do something with biohacking. So I was like, cool, me, me too, but it's close. Then he found out they had a members meeting, so he went for the meeting and he, they were like, yeah, you can use the space. So we were like, okay, cool. And uh, it turns out that the people who used to hack here a lot got busy with jobs. So they w- didn't have the time to keep coming down and stuff. So we just got to work. So me and my friend, who started doing a project together, and another biohacker, who uh, was doing some stuff here. Um, she's not here anymore because she's moved to Berlin. But we started. There was just three of us who would come down and actually be doing stuff here. Mm-hmm. And then I don't know what happened. Uh, we had a bio and beers event because we have a monthly meetup. And then some more people. We have usually for the meetup we get a lot of people, about 30 people who come down for biohacking meetups. Mm-hmm. 
and we just made an announcement and then two or three people got involved. There used to be a big community before doing group experiments, things like that. Then thing you know, if, again, I said, if you don't have someone who's here permanently to actually engage the community and plan events and stuff, it gets a bit hard. Mm -hmm. So things can get quiet. And then we found that I was here a lot, she was here a lot, and then we said, okay, let's try and grow the community. And it worked. We had uh, a festival that we did an installation for last year, mm. and there were five of us who actually participated and actually stayed there. And then I'm still here from the five, uh, and Bur, who you've already spoke to, is also here doing the Spirulina project with a group of four people. Mm. And now we have another festival coming up in May, for it's which we have to do a big festival, right? We have to do some really cool stuff for that. Mm. I have amazing plans, and I just need a nice group of people to execute this with. Because I can do it all alone, but that's no fun, right? Mm -hmm. You want to engage the community. Mm -hmm. I find that there's a gap between people who want to do things and people who actually do things. And this is why the bio, DIY bio, or DIY in general has not reached its maximum potential because of people who hesitate. I want to do something, but maybe, I don't know, I don't know how, I don't have the time. I don't know if someone will help me. Is it really a good idea? If you actually sit to think of all of these things, you are not going to get anything done. So you have to just break through. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Who's, who's the other person who's, who was usually here? Her name is Miriam, mm. and she's like a she's she's a computer engineer. Um, who also works with microfluidics, but now is doing a postdoc. She was doing a PhD in Denmark at the time. Mm. She's really cool. I totally respect her. She got me uh, into the system, and yeah, mm. now I can actually do a lot more because she did have. This was what amazed me. She was doing biological stuff in the biohack lab without having a biological background, and I was like, if she can do all this, man, I should really do much better. And then uh, I started developing holistic skills it's not just bio i need to do electronics i need to do designing i need to do woodworking machining and then try and put this all together so and that's where the rest of levy comes yeah. in right? and that's why i think this is a beautiful space because you have bio you have electronics you have machining you have a fucking kitchen because if you i starve like i'm starving right now <laughs> so you can actually get grab food here yeah. and a lot of hacker spaces at least in India yeah. need to learn this mm -hmm. people spend a large amount of time you know when you go to a hacker space you're not gonna go for an hour or two spend like four or five hours there and food is something that you really need to look at so yeah mm -hmm. having a kitchen is a really good thing here mm -hmm. do you want me to grab a bite now? no you yeah. can do it later it's fine okay yeah. 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 okay so other things that you can cannot do in this in this space yeah so as with any uh, if you are familiar with bioethics you and biosafety you have biosafety levels and when you have a certification that means you can actually do what you're certified to do the local garage is not certified as a biosafety level one or anything mm -hmm. so we're not so there's certain limitation you can do hobby stuff you can grow harmless microbes like a lot of people like to grow algae like spirulina for example spirulina is harmless right and if uh, you do it with a member who has actually worked in a biological lab then they know the best practices so we may not have uh, you can't do genetic modification that's a big no-no so if you want to do a dirty DNA extraction that's fine if you maybe even want to run a gel with that dirty DNA it's fine but when you get into the act of actually cloning and creating a construct and putting that into bacteria, that's where it gets a bit, like, you, you can't do that. Hmm. It's possible. I mean, if you get accreditation, you can actually get a biosafety level one. If we clean the place up and we actually get a, some stuff organized, we can get that uh, BSL. But then you do all of that, and then if the community isn't big enough to actually come down and do experiments, then what's it all for, hmm. right? So it's... It really, I mean, this kind of stuff really works on a community basis. So, if there are like 10 people who say, we want to do really advanced biohacking, and then you have a strong case, you can actually push for some money, get some investment to actually scale up, make it a slightly bigger space where people get a, their own workbench, things like that. So there's a lot you can do. But as far as what you can't do, 
you can't do anything that could harm someone else. We, we really advise people that if you have bad intentions, do not come here. If you want to do um, just simple stuff to learn and things like that, that's great. We can help you out. You can grow harmless microbes. You can work with um, raw DNA. You can't do any modification. You can't go and make silly chemical mixtures and try and, I don't know. It's, you have to have common sense, right? If you're going to go in a lab, if you don't know what to do, ask someone mm. who does. That's how you start. Then you come to a point where I know I'm good enough on my own, but I don't know something. Am I allowed to do this? If you don't know, ask. Am I allowed to do genetic modification? No, sorry, you can't. Okay, cool. I'll work around it. But if you just come in, and, so you know how it is, right? It's the, a makerspace has its own culture. And that's how it works. If you ask for help, you will get it. Mm. So there's a few things when, we, when a new member joins. We make clear that you can't do this and you can't do that. And if you're not sure if you can do it or not, please ask. And that's it's worked so far, and I think it's continuing to go this way. Mm. Okay. And in, in your experience, um, what is the position of, let's say, the municipality of Copenhagen or the state in Copenhagen towards uh, DIY bio or biohacking? I think they're really proactive. I mean, I don't know if they get involved as much, but they do fund uh, events that use things like this. So, for example, we were at Click, we're going to be at Click Festival, which is sponsored by a commune in Helsinki, mm -hmm. a city in the north of Denmark. Mm -hmm. And we've also done festival setups in Copenhagen, which again, the commune puts some money. So, they know that the money they give is going to events that involve biohacking and bio art. But I'm not sure how they are not really involved, primarily because what's to get involved in? I mean, what 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 can the if you have a really good idea for a product or some kind of exhibition, you can write for funds and they can give you funds. But then it comes down to the individual. There are a lot of resources that you can use, but it comes down to who's gonna do the footwork, who's actually gonna put the time and effort required to actually do something like this. Right, right. So there's, there's no fear then of people doing GMOs and all that? Yeah, I mean... I mean, it's understood that you yeah. can't do it here, but yeah. is there any sort yeah. of fear or... No, not acceptance? really. No, I mean, the reason being that Denmark as a country is... Uh, a lot of it works on trust. So if, if uh, someone comes down here, to, even if they come down in secret and they inspect the place, I mean, it's really easy to see that the people who you could just write an email and find out the people who run the space or the people who come to the space. We always do a background check. So if anyone asks us, hey, do you know this person? Yeah, sure, we know everything about him. And not run a background check per se, but it's not like we have this big database. We just yeah, do, like how we're doing a talk, we do a small talk with them, find out what they want to do, what their uh, understanding of biology is and how they would like to would they like to involve people in their experiments would they like to do it alone and then we give them an introduction to the space so you generally get to know a person before it's good right you get to know you have a and we ask them to write at least to the group what their motivation is for working in the space so i mean sure people can lie but then at least you have their personal details and it God forbid, we've never had this problem before, but if it ever becomes a concern, then we have something to fall back on. Yes, we know this person, we have their details, so if you ever need to find them, then we can. Mm. But it's not something that I ever see will be necessary. Mm. Okay, and um, so I think I mentioned before as well that I've, I've looked on the websites and the project are really cool, except that uh, you told me that the website's a bit outdated. Yeah, oh my god. That's also another thing, right? Doing projects is one thing. Actually putting it up and documenting it is a completely different uh, area. Yeah. So, so, yeah, we need to put up a lot of stuff. Mm. So, but you've, you've had lots of activities since the yeah. website was last updated. Yeah. Uh, where's all that documentation at the moment, if I may ask? So, a lot of my stuff, at least uh, the stuff that I do here, is documented on my laptop. Yeah. Uh, I need to write, to, 
tutorials for some stuff, which I want to do. I'm a bit of a perfectionist of sorts. If I if I want to do something, I really want to do it right. So if I if I have uh, built something which I want to put up online, I'm going to make sure that the tutorial is perfect. And I don't know if that's the best thing, but that's how I work. Um, a lot of the other stuff is bits and pieces around. Like the spirulina group, who's growing spirulina here, they have their own group where they document their stuff. And it just needs to be put up to a website, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, a website is just some way in which someone who Googles you can find out what's going on. Mm -hmm. And we still do group experiment nights, if that makes sense. It's just that the workshops and stuff that we've been organizing and doing are not the pictures aren't up to date, there's something new that needs to be added, uh, things like that. Right. Okay. And I also, when, when I um, looked up uh, stuff about this place, I found this group, Hoop, Hoop. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, what is that one about? So basically, um, Hoop is like some members of uh, Biologic Garage that would do their stuff here. And they felt like they needed to have a more artistic, they wanted to be uh, bio art and not focus too much on the technical but how you can use it to have an aesthetic appeal mm -hmm. which is cool uh, so they formed a small organization which is which involves a lot of artists as well so that's cool i don't know much of them but my friend was all on in few, mm -hmm. whatever and they did the algae bar right, right. so the algae bar the person i don't know who started it but the algae bar is under fruit. Right. And fruit means moisture in okay. Danish. Yeah. Yeah. So it makes sense, like moisture, uh, algae, uh, algae uh, kind of sense. Is it in the still active? I have no idea. To be honest, I mean, I know some of the members. I don't know if it's active as an organization. But I'm sure if we write to them, they would reply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I saw the website and I think the the last thing or maybe the only thing on it was the LG bar. Yeah. <laughs> so I was wondering whether it was still active or not. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, you know, I, ha I had the last question but it seems to have slipped my mind. <laughs> that happened. Um, hmm. Yeah, it's completely gone now. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, maybe we should just stop here for today. Okay. Um, but thank you very much no for this. Yeah, that uh, was great. Yeah. Really interesting take on the, to hear the questions because you know the questions also make you understand. Okay, cool. You learn a lot more, a little bit more about uh, what you're doing as well, what you could be doing better, like documenting and putting it up on the website. I know I should do that. Or you know, at least backing it up. Yeah, definitely. Look, the data is all stored. Pictures and everything is all stored. Code, uh, everything is all there. Mm -hmm. It's just not out in the web just yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay then. Um, um, mind if I just you know take a yeah, short sure. yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Oh yes, oh, I remember the question, which is, um, so we know Hacteria connects a lot of the West and the East, yeah. right? Um, how about in Europe itself, is there a, a network for... Yeah, they do, they have, uh, they have like, like there's DIYBio.org, there's a uh, HackBio.eu or Hack... Hack bio, biohack.eu or something like that. There's a network of uh, EU biohackers as well. Mm -hmm. Is it active? I don't know. I mean, the thing is that, you know, it's nice. This is why you have to have a team that actually works on it. Like, you have to have one guy who's doing the community stuff. You have to have one guy who's pushing projects. You have to have, it takes a lot of people because it, you, I, I don't like spending as much time reading about what anyone else is doing. Because then when will I read about what I'm doing? So if I have to learn to do new things, then I don't have time to... I mean, of course, if my reading takes me across something that someone's doing which I find really interesting. Mm -hmm. I know uh, through Hacteria, I know of a lot of things that have been going on. But I don't know of the EU, special EU uh, thing in particular. Mm -hmm. okay. But if you are interested, most likely your Google search will take you to people yeah, yeah. To, from Hacktiria. Mm -hmm.
Mm. Yeah, I found some of them, but I was just wondering mm, whether they are uh, whether they are still active or um, whether there are any thoughts on them. Yeah. But okay. Thank right, you so super. much. Yeah. Great. You want to get a video of the room? Yeah. I'll get out of the frame so you get a better view. Just a quick video.